Welcome to week three's third lecture. So, in the uh, in the previous lecture, we figured out the intertemporal budget constraint, and we had two forms in which we could look at the uh, we, we could look at it. Uh, one was uh, what we call as the future value budget constraint, where there are no interest rate terms associated with the second period values, but we are working with the second period values of M one as well as C one. The other way of looking at it uh, is uh, looking at the point of view from the first period, saying that, okay, M1 is what I have today. M2 is what I will have next period. So how much, of, uh, how much is the value of M2 next period today? That I will get by dividing by 1 plus R. Similarly for C2 divided by 1 plus R. So I'm trying to find out what is the value of the second period variables today so that I can decide based on uh, the total income available to me uh, as to how I'm going to allocate uh, that total income, present value of total income between consumption today and consumption tomorrow. Let's complicate things uh, a little bit. Remember, we initially assumed that P1 and P2 were equal to 1 because we just wanted to deal with one uh, complication at a time. In the last, uh, in the previous slides, it was basically just the rate of interest. Now let's assume that P1 and P2 are not just one, they are positive uh, and greater than one. So uh, how does this affect the budget constraint? So let's just quickly work it out. We have worked out most of it. Uh, we just need to take uh, care of the second of the prices, which are greater than one now. So now the intertemporal choice problem becomes that uh, the consumer has to choose uh, an optimal intertemporal consumption bundle, which is C1 star, C2 star, given the prices P1, P2. The maximum possible expenditure in period two that could be done uh, is M2 plus 1 plus R into M1. So this is the future value of my income. So the maximum possible consumption I could have in the second period is going to be the total uh, future value of the lifetime income divided by the price of the second period consumption good. So think of this as uh, an intercept on the y-axis. If on the other hand, I decide to spend all my income in the first period, then I have to look at the present value of my income. And to find out what consumption I would have in terms of units, I divide that by P1, which is the price of uh, consumption bundle in period one. So that's your X axis or X uh, uh, or the X intercept. Now we just have to figure out uh, how to write this equation into uh, point slope form so that we also know the slope uh, along with knowing the two intercepts. So let's say that there is some positive uh, saving in the first period. So M1 is the total income available. P1, C1 is the total expenditure on the first period consumption bundle. So when I subtract that from my total available income, I get the savings for the first period. They grow at the rate of one plus R and uh, with uh, M2, which is my second period income, that is the total consumption that I could have. So P2, C2, which is the expenditure on the second period is gonna be equal to M2 plus whatever savings uh, that have grown from the last period. Now, because we are drawing everything in C2, C1 space, all that needs to be done is to solve this equation for C2. The simplest way to do that is divide both the sides by P2. Even though that is a good form for uh, understanding the point slope form, you can also look at what would be the present valued form or the present value budget constraint now when the prices are positive. As you could expect, 
when P2 was 1, uh, it was this was just C2 divided by 1 plus R. Now, because P2 is greater than 1, uh, we have that presence here. Same for uh, P1. So those terms appear uh, in this budget constraint because we are assuming the prices are to be uh, are greater than 1. So let's see how the graph looks like. The endowment point now is M1 divided by P1. P1 initially was 1, so we just wrote that as M1, but now it's going to be M1 divided by P1 and M2 divided by P2. So that is your point uh, if you consume uh, with no borrowing or no lending. We already figured out the two intercepts given by the black and the pink dot. We connect this line and we get the intertemporal budget constraint with prices greater than 1. Now, once you solve this equation for C2, you will find that 1 plus R, which is the slope of this line, gets multiplied by this P1 divided by P2. It's a ratio of the prices of these two consumption bundles. And this whole thing here becomes the slope of this line. This puts us uh, in a unique position uh, to consider what's going to be the effect of inflation on uh, consumption and savings decisions. So let's see how we can think about it. How do we define inflation rate? Inflation rate is growth in current prices. So for example, if P1 happens to be the current price of uh, the first period consumption bundle, then it will grow at the rate of pi and be equal to P2. Then pi becomes the inflation rate. So for example, if pi is 0.2, then it means there is 20% inflation rate. So P2 is going to be 20% higher compared to P1. If pi is 1, then it means there is 100% inflation. So P2 is going to be 100% more than uh, P1. So it's basically going to be twice. Now let's, uh, to make our life simple, let's do one thing. Let's set price of the uh, first period consumption bundle to be 1. Okay. In that case, the second period price becomes 1 plus pi. It's just easier uh, to handle uh, the ratios. So then we can rewrite uh, our budget constraint as so now P1 uh, becomes 1, so we just have C1. Uh, P2 becomes 1 plus pi, so I just substituted that here, uh, into C2 is equal to M1 plus M2 divided by 1 plus R. So we get a neat representation here. And as you can see, this ratio here is going to play an important part in determining the slope and the play between uh, the rate of return on your savings and the loss of value of money at the rate of pi. So once I solve this for C2, now the slope is going to be 1 plus r divided by 1 plus pi. So now you can see that for a given interest rate, if inflation is higher, then the slope declines. If inflation is lower, then the slope increases. So now the budget constraint, the intertemporal budget constraint moves because of two factors. One is the rate of interest and second is the inflation rate. Without uh, inflation, the slope was minus 1 plus r and now it is minus 1 plus r divided by 1 plus pi. Let's call this as price inflation, okay? And let's um, let's basically uh, say that uh, this ratio is equal to one plus rho. And rho here is gonna become the real interest rate. So once you solve everything, uh, you basically get rho is equal to r minus pi divided by 1 plus pi. And now you can see that if you assume very small values for pi, 
then uh, we can easily approximate uh, the real interest rate by saying that it is nominal interest rate or minus the inflation rate. So this is the Fisher equation, which you must have uh, learned in your principles courses. We can make a neat table uh, for a given nominal interest rate and an inflation rate. You can find out uh, what is going to be the real interest rate. All right, uh, so as we said before, the constraint becomes flatter if the interest rate falls or the inflation rate rises. And it becomes steeper if the interest rate increases or the inflation rate falls. So now we have, so let's say that this consumer is saving here. An increase in the inflation rate or a decrease in the interest rate flattens the budget constraint. It reduces the returns to savings. So if the consumer saves, then saving and welfare are reduced by a lower interest rate or a higher inflation rate. On the other hand, let's talk about the lender. Uh, sorry, the borrower. Now this consumer is borrowing. Let's say that the inflation rate uh, falls, okay? and interest rate rises. So it flattens the budget constraint again. Uh, if the budget constraint becomes flat, uh, then uh, the consumer basically uh, can be better off because he can borrow uh, at a lower interest rate or a higher inflation rate. 